Hello hackers, welcome back to Automated Vulnerability Discovery. Today we're talking about symbolic execution, dynamic symbolic execution. Of course, it's a dynamic analysis, um, which means that in order to analyze what is going on with code, it has to execute it. All right, so let's roll on the core idea of dynamic symbolic execution is that you emulate the program on what is called a symbolic data domain. A typical CPU operates on ones and zeros, right? If you read in user input using the read system call, what you get are ones or zeros. As a human interacting with the program, you can't send it some variable with an unknown value, but you could create an emulator that could support this. So it could be a one, a zero, or X. And then later on, as you build up uh, an understanding of what data is known, what data is unknown, and as unknown data starts being checked using compare instructions, and uh, those checks start being acted on using conditional jumps, you can actually build up formula that uh, describe the behavior of the program given the relationship between program input, conditional checks, and program output. All right. So you analyze, uh, you emulate the program, you extract formulas that describe this program, and then you add desired constraints. So if you want to get the flag, we will say, hey, we want the program output to not be incorrect. Right? And we add this constraint to our formula and we use what is called a constraint solver to solve these formulas for valid uh, uh, answers for our unknown data. That is symbolic execution. It's actually not this simple. This is a very simplified view and we'll dive into why it's not simple. Um, but first, let's talk about some history. I tracked symbolic execution back for a talk I gave at DEF CON about program analysis um, fairly far to uh, 1975. In 1975, uh, Robert Boyer, uh, now uh, uh, um, a professor emeritus at um, uh, one of the UTs, I want to say UT Austin, um, uh, created a system called SELECT, a system that did symbolic execution to find bugs in programs. 1975, very long time ago before really security was a field. Um, and I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. That's earlier than, you know, let's say the first fuzzing paper came out. This is probably it. But then uh, a couple of weeks ago, by chance, while looking up um, the history of race conditions for the race condition module, I stumbled onto the master's thesis or maybe bachelor's thesis of Cloud Shannon. If you don't know, um, or you might know Shannon from Shannon's Entropy, um, a fundamental building block of information theory. Uh, if you don't know it, I highly recommend you learn it. It's very, very cool. So Cloud Shannon in 1938, for his master's thesis, um, wrote a paper about symbolic analysis of relay and switching circuits, where he actually um, um, identified uh, race conditions as a, an application of this sort of symbolic analysis. It's not quite the symbolic execution we're talking about, but it's uh, close and it is so long ago. So I thought, okay, finally, almost, I mean, almost 100 years, let's say, uh, you know, almost 80 years ago, this has got to be it. This is the uh, the origin, um, or actually over 80 years ago. Wow, cool. Um, well, it turns out I was off by a lot. Um, and you might say, how, how can it be much earlier than 1938? Well, we can dive back to 1842 to... Uh, um, Ada Lovelace and her analyses of Charles Babbage's analytical engine, what is um, a design that is uh, the first thing recognizable as a modern-ish computer. 
1842, Ada Lovelace wrote a number of uh, analyses of this machine designed by Charles Babbage. And one of these included a program um, that computed uh, Bernoulli numbers, one of the first programs ever written in history, um, written by Ada Lovelace. And if you look, she it, it, this is a, a, a table of her analysis of this program. She goes through step by step of what each operation does and what the results are, what the values are in the various registers. And these are symbolic. She is doing manual symbolic execution uh, in 1842. So this is probably the oldest uh, analysis paradigm we'll talk about, dynamic symbolic execution from the mid 19th century to today. Um, let's see what it's like. Today, symbol dynamic symbolic execution emulates code to convert it into math. This isn't easy, right? Um, what we saw in that first slide was a kind of a straight shot conversion. Um, what actually happens is a lot more complex. Symbolic execution has to execute code in sequence like a normal CPU. The difference is it has an emulated state that it can mess with. I'm going to disable my camera so you can see this next part clearly. As you execute the program, in a symbolic emulator, every time the program encounters a branch, the symbolic emulator has to branch its internal state into two. One of these states gets one condition that would follow the branch. The other one gets the condition that would not follow the branch. Here, it is the user input being 42 versus the user input not being 42 because that is what the compare instruction checked and the jump instruction acted on. All right, then um, once those states diverge, they start uh, doing kind of different things. Um, so on the, the in state A, uh, you have the leftovers of the uh, send file call. Um, actually, probably RAX would now be the length of the flag or whatever. Um, in state B, you have the um, result of the write system call. Uh, RAX is also probably going to be the amount of bytes written. Um, and then of course, the constraint that specifies the user input cannot be 42 here and has to be 42 here. And the um, uh, relationship of the program output being incorrect here and being whatever the flag value is there. Um, that is how a symbolic execution engine works. And we're going to look at it in practice right now on a symbolic execution engine um, that uh, I created with my awesome colleagues back in my graduate career and that we still continue to improve, develop, and research on top of up to this day um, at Arizona State University, um, which and this, this system is Anger. Um, there's a bunch of symbolic execution engines. There are more symbolic execution engines under active development than there are web browsers under active development. I'm not sure why this is, but it, that is how it is. Um, Anger is not the only game in town. It's just what I am most familiar with um, and also what is installed in your containers. Um, so let's take a look. Um, we have our compare program that takes one byte, compares against a value. Of course, it's 42. Uh, it's exactly what was on the slide and then tells us uh, failure instead of incorrect or success if it's correct. Uh, I didn't bother with a flag here. All right, so let's check out how we would use anger to solve this. Import it in IPython. Anger has a concept of a project. This is um, basically an, an open binary along with its libraries and everything. Um, we can get various information such as the entry point. We can get um, the block, disassemble uh, the block at that entry point. <clears throat> Uh, 
and and various other things one thing that we can do is create what is called a simulation manager this is that emulator that we're talking about um, or, or the interface to the to Angers emulator it starts out with an active state this is a state that has stuff like registers so these are the registers that um, start out with the values that they start out on uh, with um, when the program uh, begins executing um, we have memory so for example if we load memory at the uh, base at um, of the elf you can load four bytes and those read 7f elf as expected all right so that's all very cool um actually let's let me let me oh i don't have it installed uh now i have to remember how to decode this here is 7f elf all right so um let's start stepping through execution we are emulating the program we can actually see the history of this state oops what's going on the the path that it took through the program executing um, this means that there was a conditional jump but only one condition could be satisfied mathematically. So uh, that uh, cannot be taken. But if we keep stepping, eventually the state will split. In fact, we can say run until, write a Python Lambda function. If you don't know what this is, swap out, uh, tab out, look it up real quick, come back. Lambda function takes a, uh, a sim uh, simulation manager, the, sim the same simulation manager as an argument, um, and it says, um, and, and, and it, it just calculates a condition to stop executing at. So this will say execute until um, there is more than one active state. Boom, there's two active states now. So what happened? um let's take a look here is the history of both and the last thing they both executed of course because they were the same path until the same state until very recently was um, this block with two satisfiable successors that's why we now have two states in the emulator, um, let's take a look at what this is. And it's our compare and jump. Cool. One more thing I want to show you on one state. We have a constraint that the input equals 42 on the other one we have a constraint that the input does not equal 42. Pretty cool, huh? All right, let's uh, push forward. So this is uh, um, the, these are the active states. We, what we're gonna do what is called, uh, we're gonna run until the end, until program, until all states terminate. Usually this is not successful, usually uh as we'll discuss in a second these analyses actually are are very 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 um not perform or not scalable uh, they don't terminate but excuse me um this was a very very simple program and they did and again we can look at the const the constraints now we don't have any dead-ended ones anymore Oh, sorry, active ones, they're both dead-ended. Um, so here we have these two states, one that has the uh, um, constraint as equal, one as 
not equal. And another thing that we can look is their uh, standard output. You can call concretize. Concretize is concretization is the process of querying a constraint solver to solve the formula to go from, um, and of course these form formulas are very simple, to go from mathematical formula to ones and zeros. So on one state, um, the state that uh, is not 42, it says failure. The state that where the standard input was 42, the state one, it says success. Very cool. We can also concretize using the same technique with the constraint solvers, standard input. So on the state where we have a successful state, the input is a star. Let's take a look. And of course, that's a success. All right. So um, that is awesome. Symbolic execution is the coolest kit on the block. We uh, don't need anything else. We'll just use this to explore software, identify vulnerabilities. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Symbolic execution has serious, serious limitations. And these limitations are that it has to follow every path to understand what is going on. It's a dynamic analysis, right? The uh, program that we are looking at is very simple. Compares against 42, jumps to get the flag. What if you had something that is just, just a tiny bit more complex? What if it called A2I, ASCII to integer, and then compared against 42? So you actually send four two. Oh, I realized obviously that's not solvable. Let me fix that real quick. All right, much better. So we have, um, we read in two bytes and then we call A2I. So if you type 42, then you should uh, uh, get this correct. Well, it turns out that depending on the implementation of A2I, Symbolic execution can no longer solve this. Consider this insane implementation of A2I. It's not a very good implementation. Um, but the interesting thing about doing program analysis is you don't get to decide what implementations you're analyzing. You analyze the code of the programs you want to uh, get some understanding of. And those programs might have A2I implementations written in this insane way. So. How would we um, approach this? Uh, let's just trace through the executor as it executes this program uh, or this function. We start out with a string. We don't know what is in it. It is unconstrained input data that we just read in from standard in. Um, of course, we know this is uh, size two. I'm just gonna show you for arbitrary sizes. The first time around the loop, we will split the state into 10 depending on which of these constraints gets added to the state. And we'll split them all into 10 and uh, actually 11, one for the default constraint where it's not a digit and A2I terminates. And we will just uh, add different constraints to each one. So the first time through, we have 10 different states. The second time, each of these states will split into 10 different states and so on and so on. This is what's called a state explosion in symbolic execution. And this is the number one reason that symbolic execution is non-viable. Um, let's, uh, let's take a look at what happens in anger, right? Um, let's grab uh, our IPython session. Oh, uh, I should show you, I created this exact thing, a2i.c. Now it does success failure. I'll show you that it does work with 42 and not with other things. All right. Import anger. Load the, uh, oops, wrong binary. Load the a2i binary. Create the simulation manager. Let's run until uh, there's more than one path. Okay, there are two paths. 
Now let's see what, what happens when we step. Let's, we can see the path explosion happening in real time. There it is. This is all inside the A2I function. That's a, a bad news. And we can step for a very long time. So there's one that uh, state that's dead ended. Let's see what it, its uh, input is. Uh, we can still, of course, query the constraint solver. Um, ah, in this program, I forgot, it, it actually reads 10 bytes, not two. Uh, sorry about that. So it read all null bytes. So this is the case where the first byte is not an integer and A2I returns zero. Let's keep stepping until we get a second uh, dead ended guy. Now you can see it's taking longer and longer because it has to emulate 187 blocks every time I try to take a step forward. Ooh, we have a second dead-ended person uh, path uh, state. This is the case where the first number is a zero. And obviously we're not going to sit through this. I'll do this one more time. Oops, off by one that is the case where it's a one. Uh, it'll take a very long time and a lot of paths to get to 42 there. We won't reach it uh, before my computer runs out of memory. Um, path explosion is a problem. There are some uh, research techniques to try to solve it. This specific case can be easily solved. You can merge um states using a technique called uh very testing into mathematically complex uh formula but a single state uh the problem is when you try to do that as you get more and more complex formula you start overwhelming the solvers themselves constraints are solved using what is called smt solvers this is uh, a technique called satisfiability modulo theories it's a mathematical um, area of research actually on how to solve these uh, constraints um, and the basic idea of SMT is you have these theories the theories encode different types of simplifications essentially stuff like a times B equals B times a or more specifically uh, a times B is not equal to B times a plus anything but a zero and this sort of thing so we try a bunch of mass simplifications. We check against common cases. We check if something can be trivially solved using these simplifications. If not, we keep trying different theories. Eventually we run out of theories. We synthesize a circuit that represents the actual bits involved, even if those bits are unknown. And then we resort to Boolean satisfiability because now these bits are uh, Booleans, ones and zeros. Boolean satisfiability is called SAT. It is a NP-complete problem, actually the first problem to be proven to be NP-complete. That means that we do not have a polynomial time algorithm that can solve this. Algorithms that solve uh, SAT are uh, exponential or just sub-exponential. So it can be very slow to solve complex programs, as in it might not terminate before you uh, starve to death in front of your computer. The takeaway here is faced with complex data, complex operations, symbolic executions fail, not just due to path explosion, but also due to constraint solving limitations. And finally, there's a problem of uh, modeling the environment. You saw that we were emulating everything, right, in anger. <clears throat> emulating the CPU is actually easy. Let me fix that typo there. Um, emulating the CPU is, is, is relatively easy. Um, there's existing uh, support. I don't want to drill down that deeply, but basically we um, use existing code to translate x86, ARM, MIPS, whatever architecture we're working on <clears throat> to a common language that we then emulate. Um, that's not hard. What's hard is emulating the OS. Read is simple. 
right? A read system call that gets data from standard in. But what about load module? A system call that loads a kernel module. Obviously we don't run the whole kernel. And if we try to run the whole kernel, then we'd run into the scalability issues of path explosion um, and so on. So uh, these three limitations really, really heavily hold symbolic executions back. And we're reminded of the quote by Mikhail Zalewski, the creator of the most successful fuzzer in the world, that the uses of symbolic execution, concolic execution, static analysis, and other emerging technologies to spot substantial vulnerabilities in complex, unstructured, and non-annotated code are still in their infancy. Note, he's not talking about fuzzers. He's talking about this stuff. Um, this is an active area of research. Uh, a lot of uh, academics around the world, including people in my lab at ASU, along with my colleagues, um, we're working on this. If you're interested, let us know.